So Danny and Annie recorded that on a Thursday, and it aired on, um, on NPR, National Public Radio, the next Friday, and about an hour, two hours after the broadcast, Danny died. Um, and um, Annie received uh, thousands and thousands of letters from public radio listeners, uh, condolence letters. Uh, she actually buried a copy of the letters with um, Danny and kept a copy for herself, and still to this day, um, four years later, reads um, one of them each day instead of the letter that she would have gotten from Danny. Um, I know Simon said that I was, this was going to be like really fun, and I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm actually thinking I'm going to hit you with like a deluge of really depressing stories. How's that for turning things around? Does anyone have any questions before I go on and play more StoryCorps stuff? I think I'll play some from this year. I'm going to stand here until someone raises their hand and asks a question. Yes. Yeah. So these, are, yeah. So they're forty-minute interviews. Um, uh, uh, Forty, um, forty thousand interviews, about twenty-five thousand hours so far. Um, they're at the Library of Congress. You have at this point, you have to go to the Library of Congress to access the full interviews. Um, but we we're going to turn ten in October twenty thirteen. Sometime around then, we'll make the archive public in some way on the internet so that people can um, search it. You know, I have concerns. You know, I'm very concerned about protecting the privacy of the people who participate in StoryCorps. Um, and you know, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about this experiment is that when StoryCorps started, you know, when you come to the booth. At the end of the interview, you can sign a release or not sign a release for this to go to the Library of Congress. If you don't sign a release, you walk away with both CDs. There's no record that you ever came to StoryCorps. You had a great experience, we hope and expect, and that's great as far as we're concerned. And I thought um, that we'd have a compliance rate because what happens in the booth is so personal in the 70, 60, 80 percent um, range for signing these releases. And 40,000 interviews later, it's above 99.5%, uh, which speaks to people's desire to leave this record. Um, but I, I, you know, we're, we're still kind of working through the ethical issues, even though we have the right to put these on the internet, of making sure that the participants are protected when this goes um, public. Yes? Um, I just wanted to ask a little oh, oh. I just wanted to ask a little bit Where about... Where are you? I don't, I don't I'm see I'm right back here. Okay, hi. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a little bit about the practicalities of the interviews. Mm -hmm. Do, does the facilitator ask, ask questions, suggest questions? Do you have like a handout to yeah. guide them through those 45 minutes? So we... Um, People, often, people usually prepare before they come to StoryCorps. We have something on our website which is called a question generator, which actually started out as the questions that these kids asked in Chicago from this documentary 20 years ago. Um, but it's, now it's got hundreds of questions where you can check off what you want to ask depending on. We have the top 10 most used questions and then other questions so people prepare before they come in. The um, facilitators have this really amazing job. Most of them serve a one-year tour with StoryCorps. It's incredibly draining. Um, and they're hired because they're great listeners. And their job, um, they call it bearing witness. Uh, and they are there to do whatever the participants want them to do. Sometimes they'll ask questions, sometimes they won't. Um, they're there to make the participants comfortable. They also keep logs of what's happening during the interview, and that'll be part of what's part of this archive. Um, so you'll be able to like go to, at 22.13, people are talking about whatever, and you can click there and listen to it. And they also learn how to do rough edits of stories. Um, so they'll pick a couple every week and send it into our production team in, in New York, who chooses what story is going to be broadcast on public radio. Um, so, um, and, and I should say that we think of every story as equally valuable. There are some that have this universal quality that make them appropriate to broadcast. but we don't think of those stories as better than the ones that, that aren't broadcast. Um, so, you know, basically they have this kind of fascinating job where because of the nature of what happens in the booth, they're, they're kind of collecting the wisdom of humanity. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting job. It's very hard, very hard. They burn out very quickly because there are a lot of very intense interviews that happen in the booth. Right. Uh, technical question. Yeah, sure. Uh, there, I know that there have been longevity problems with uh, individually cut CDs, particularly dating from the early days. Yeah. Uh, do you have solid state backup? Yeah. So um, I, you know, thank you. That's a great question. Um, uh, I I use the. Um, it's a shortcut to say we have a CD. Two CDs are burned. We also have a digital file that's burned. Uh, the the Library of Congress keeps the CDs for archival purposes, but everything's done with the digital files. One more question, then I'm going to play more tape. Uh, 
Hi, yes. David, what is your explanation of this um, popularity? Of the popularity of, of why people want to participate yeah. in StoryCorps? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, it's not that different than the signing of the, um, of the releases. I mean, I think it, people want to leave a record, people want to be heard. Um, I mean, I like to think of StoryCorps as kind of the polar opposite of the, um, you know, in the U.S. and the U.K., there's this kind of reality TV culture. You know, this is nobody who comes to StoryCorps is, go, is there to get famous. Nobody is there to get rich. It's just a pure act of generosity. And I think that's what comes through in these interviews. Um, so, you know, I guess partly because people like the stories on public radio and that's kind of gotten them um, interested in participating in this. But I'm 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 I'm. I guess I was surprised. I was told by my mentor when I launched StoryCorps that I was going to have a very hard time filling the booth. And that surprised me. Um, and he was right. Um, but um, so, so I guess I always expected people to want to do this. And I was more surprised at the beginning when they didn't. Um, but um, that's a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Thank you. Um, I'm going to play a couple stories from, um, from this year, um, one of which I've never played before and one of which I've played maybe once. Um, and this is just um, an example of what's happened in the years since we launched StoryCorps. Um, I just think this is an interesting story, one of my favorites of this past year. Um, and you're going to have to skip over. It's called Mary Johnson and O'Shea Israel. Um, and um, just an interesting use of the StoryCorps booth. Um, this is a guy named O'Shea Israel. When he was 16 years old, he um, got in a fight with, uh, with a kid, um, another 16-year-old kid. They were both in gangs, and he killed him. Um, and uh, that kid's name was uh, Laramium Bird. And 12 years into O'Shea Israel's sentence, um, Laramium Bird's mother, Mary Johnson, wanted to find out who this person was who murdered her son. Um, uh, O'Shea got out of prison two years ago. He's now 34 years old. And the two of them came to StoryCorps together um, in Minneapolis, actually, and had this conversation. So this is O'Shea Israel and the mother of the boy who he, uh, who he murdered 12 years ago. You and I met at Stillwater Prison. I wanted to know if you were in the same mindset of what I remember from court, where I wanted to go over and hurt you, but you were not that 16-year-old. You were a grown man. I shared with you about my son. And he became human to me. You know, when I met you, it was like, okay, this guy is real. And then when it was time to go, you broke down and started shedding tears. And the initial thing to do was just try to hold you up as best I can. Just hug you like I would my own mother, you know. After you left the room, I began to say, I just hugged the man that murdered my son. And I instantly knew that all that anger and the animosity, all the stuff I had in my heart for 12 years for you, I knew it was over that I had totally forgiven you. As far as receiving forgiveness from you, sometimes I still don't know how to take it because I haven't totally forgiven myself yet. It's something that I'm learning from you. I won't say that I have learned yet because it's still a process that I'm going through. I treat you as I would treat my son and our relationship is beyond belief. We live next door to one another. Yeah, so you can see what I'm doing. You know, firsthand. Mm -hmm. We actually bump into each other all the time, leaving in and out of the house. And you know, our conversations, they come from, boy, how come you ain't called over here to check on me in a couple of days? <laughs> you ain't even asked me if I need my garbage to go out. Uh -huh. I find those things funny because it's a relationship with a mother for real. Well, my natural son is no longer here. I didn't see him graduate. You know, you're going to college. I'll have the opportunity to see you graduate. I didn't see him get married. Hopefully one day I'll be able to experience that with you. And just to hear you say those things and to be in my life in the manner in which you are is my motivation. It motivates me to make sure that I stay on the right path. You still believe in me. And the fact that you can do it despite how much pain I cause you, it's amazing. I know it's not an easy thing, you know, to be able to share our story together, even with us sitting here looking at each other right now. I know it's not an easy thing, 
So I admire that you can do this. I love you, lady. I love you too, son. Um, one of the, um, we've, we've launched a series of special initiatives with StoryCorps over the years where we'll focus on a particular group. Um, so we have an African American initiative where, which is now the largest collection of African American voices ever gathered. Um, we have one for people in hospice and palliative care. We have an Alzheimer's initiative. The first one we ever launched was with the 9-11 Museum, where everyone who lost a loved one on September 11th comes to StoryCorps to leave a record um, of their life. And you know, it's interesting, because when I started StoryCorps, it hadn't occurred to me that people would come to leave tributes to people who had died. Um, and that was something within the first days after StoryCorps launched that we began to see. So this 9-11 piece um, made a great deal of sense. And we've recorded, I don't know, over 1,000 um, uh, interviews uh, remembering people who, who passed away. And this past um, September was the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Of and um, we played a story which I've never played publicly before, um, but I will now. This is, um, this is uh, 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 an interview with a guy named Michael Duffy, who was a Franciscan, um, who is a Franciscan priest. And his best friend was a guy named Michael Judge. Michael Judge was actually victim number one of September 11th. He was um, the chaplain for the New York City Fire Department, also a Franciscan priest. And there's a very, very famous picture of him being carried out from the rubble, um, which is known as the American Pieta. And it's um, him with his head splayed back and his arms out being carried by other firemen. Um, and um, uh, they met when they were Franciscan uh, priests in the same parish in New Jersey in the 70s. Um, and, and Father Duffy was um, serving poor people in Philadelphia when he got the call that, um, that Michael Judge had died on September 11th. Um, and he was called um, four days later to deliver the homily at his, um, at his funeral. Um, and uh, this, is, this is, you know, we do this occasionally. This is a StoryCorps um, interview mixed with tape. So this is Michael Judge talking about giving the homily um, mixed with th this uh, phenomenal homily that, that he gave. Um, and this is one of the stories we played this past September um, on the anniversary of, of September 11th. So this is um, uh, Michael Duffy. Um, talking about the homily he delivered, and you will listen to, to the homily as well. And you can find that next in your transcript. We Franciscans are a little odd, and one of our oddities is there's a form we fill out. It's called On My Death. It says where you want your funeral mass to be, who you want to do the homily, and et cetera, like that. So 9-11 happened on a Tuesday. Well, the next day, the phone rang, and it was our provincial in New York. And he said, Michael wanted you to do the homily. And I said, well, yes, but this is different. It should be something. I'm going to, um, over the last 18 months or so, StoryCorps has um, gone into TV, uh, which I know is a heresy, certainly for me and with this group. I've asked them there to be an ambulance at the back in case anybody has a heart attack when I start playing videos. Um, but um, I, uh, I will never allow cameras into the booth. It's always going to be an audio project. Obviously, I've devoted my life to voice and, and audio and, and have no interest in, um, actually no interest really in visuals whatsoever. But I did know that um, you know, our, what we're trying to do with StoryCorps is to build an, a national institution. I should say that we're, um, the first um, launch of StoryCorps outside of the US happened this month in the UK with something called the Listing Project, which um, Tony Phillips has uh, spearheaded here. and we're happy about that, thrilled about that, and apparently it's going very well. Um, but um, we are really focused on, on building this institution in the U.S. that we hope will someday touch the lives of every American family. And I, and I realized that we needed to go into um, video somehow in order to reach a younger audience, because that's the reality of life in the United States. And I kind of thought of these videos and continue to think of them as sort of gateway drugs to get um, younger people interested in StoryCorps, and then hopefully they'll listen to the audio. Um, and I thought I would play um, one of the animations that we also did for 9-11, so you can compare that previous piece, which I had not heard since the broadcast, and it, the production team did a remarkable job on it. Um, but this is an animated um, story, core story, um, also from the 9-11 project. This is a father who lost um, 
to uh, his, uh, his two sons on September 11th. One was a police officer, um, one was a, um, a firefighter. Uh, the father was a firefighter, his father was a firefighter also. Um, and uh, it's called John and Joe, and you may hate it, you may not, we'll see. Um, but here is a, uh, here's a video of a story, core story, an animation of a story, core story. very close to being out of time. I think I'm going to, I'll play one more um, animation um, before we, we end, but does anybody have, I'm happy to answer a couple more questions if anybody has a question. Sure. Do you want to wait? I, I, I guess we're taping this, so if you want to wait for a mic, just one sec. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering, the project's been running for quite a long time. You've got a hell of a lot of stories. Have you noticed a change in the dynamic of the storytelling as the project has become better known? Um, and if so, how has that affected the nature of the project? Because it strikes me that some, it could start off as two people talking to each other with the microphones eavesdropping, and it could end up with people presenting to, to yeah. an audience. Well, the presenting, you know, I, I think you will occasionally have people who try to present, but that's not stuff you'll ever hear on, on the radio. Um, I, I don't think the dynamic has changed. You know, I, I think that um, it's very consistent. Actually, the themes that come up in the booth are very consistent. They're the great themes of human existence because people are summing up their lives in 40 minutes. So it's love and death and family. Um, but the um, kind of tapestry of stories that come out of those themes are remarkable. Um, uh, you, um, you know, and, and I, I, I think it, it, it's a little bit of a, um, I guess it's slightly untrue to say that the stories keep getting better um, because, uh, I mean, I think that the reason that the stories get better is because the volume of interviews we're doing is bigger. So we have a bigger pool of stories to choose from. But um, what's happening in the booth is, um, is, uh, is very, very consistent from interview to interview. And we do a lot of training with the facilitators to make sure that, you know, everybody basically has the same experience. I, I mean, I, I, and, and I guess from, from hearing the stories on the radio, that the people who would do interviews that would not, you know, there, there are occasionally people who will bring, like, something they want to read, uh, and the facilitators will ask them to put it away. Um, but, um, but that probably happens somewhat less frequently now, but that was kind of an outlier even from way back when. Yes. Whoever has the mic next. Oh. Uh, thank you. This is wonderful on so many levels. But uh, I'd like to know more about the technical aspects of recording. Sure. Not for technique's sakes, but because the sound, the voices are wonderfully recorded. Yeah. And I think this is very important for such a project. I, I do, but too. Yeah. Do, do the people face each other, as it says in the Mary Johnson? Yeah. And Oshi, and how come? Uh, how is it possible that they don't overlap? I mean, do they have a single microphone? Uh, no, how, do they they're, sit? Um, how is it turned? Yeah, so it's um, two chairs that face each other over a table, and there's a microphone um, above the, uh, coming down from each that's got kind of a wide um, uh, what an angle on it. Uh, and, you know, if something's... And I, I was actually having a conversation before this. I mean, I, I actually think that not doing excellent recording is just unacceptable. It's just too easy to make excellent recordings in radio. Um, so we're careful to make sure that the booth is soundproof. Um, and um, the facilitators are trained on how to place mics. And they do a, they do a pretty good job of, 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 um, of recording. And if something isn't of the highest quality, then it can't be broadcast. Um, but, but, you know, we have it standardized well enough that they know what they're doing. You have decent, I, I think we use, um, I don't remember what the model of Neumann mic is, but they're good Neumann mics and the, um, the um, recording apparatus is, is good as well and it's a nice quiet room. And people are given instructions before they start um, not to rattle jewelry and not to touch the mic and all the kind of normal stuff you're given. They, the participants do not wear headphones, the facilitator does. And, and they are very close to each other? Uh, what is the distance between the them? The distance is um, uh, probably um, uh, five feet, four, four or five feet, sitting, okay. at a, sitting at a table with sitting a lamp in between them. Okay, so they, so they look at each other's They're eyes. They're looking at each other in the eyes, right. and the microphone is above them. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, David. Um, sorry. Yes. 
how much would you say uh, do the people copy what they see on TV and how much does it differ in the respect of what they are saying, how they are narrating? Um, well, I, how, I much, how much do they, do they pretend like there's being a camera, do they act or not? And uh, well, how influenceful is that? I think zero. I mean, I th nobody is, I, I, I think people think of it as having this um, kind of um, conversation of a lifetime. Um, and uh, there's no acting. If there is, I wouldn't hear it because it would never get to me um, to be broadcast. Uh, so I think that these are, people um, talk about, and you all know this, I mean, that's the beauty of a microphone and radio. They just forget about the mics and have this conversation. And that's what we've tried to create this situation where that interaction will happen. So um, there's, there's no, I think there's no acting. I mean, I'd have to talk to the facilitators. I was in, um, I very rarely, I spend all my time fundraising now, and I retired from making radio documentaries uh, to, to devote my life to this thing about a year after StoryCorps started. And unfortunately, I get to do literally 15 minutes of creative work every week, and I'm never on the ground talking to facilitators because I'm literally having to raise like $40,000 a day to keep this thing going. Um, but um, I, I was with the facilitators last week, uh, which I, and I hadn't been for, for literally years in Nashville at a booth opening in Nashville, Tennessee in the US. And I asked them about um, the worst, the bad interviews, uh, the worst interviews. And um, they said um, that um, the worst interviews are actually, when, when we launch a booth, usually the mayor and governor of, of the state, the mayor of the town come, and they said politicians are always horrible interviews. Um, but they're practiced and they're conscious of what they're going to say. So they never, ever get broadcast. But other than that, you know, I think you're in the high, you know, 95% plus of people having real authentic conversations with each other. Yes. Can I say something? Sure. Uh, some, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, great. Um, uh, Great stories, David, thank you. I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you invite people in to tell their stories? And if so, what sort of proportion might you be talking about? And I wonder, uh, because I think you started off without the broadcast dimension, yeah. whether that broadcast dimension changed any of the, the dynamics of, of, of the process. That's a great question. Um, so 50% of our slots are open to the public. And the other 50% are done through partnerships with organizations. So the organizations are going to invite people, and we're going to talk to them about who they might want to invite to come to the booth and participate in StoryCorps. And our production team does do what we call cherry picks, where um, wherever we are, um, we may f hear about one or two people who um, we want to invite to the booth to come and have a conversation with a loved one. Um, but if you, you know, if you think about something like the 9-11 stories, I mean, that is to some extent a cherry pick because it's everyone who lost a loved one on September 11th. But the rules of a StoryCorps interview, the one rule of a StoryCorps interview is that we don't dictate what people talk about. They can talk about whatever they want to talk about. And I, the percentage of stories that are broadcast that are cherry picks are, I don't know, um, 25 percent? Okay, uh, I would uh, oh, there you are. like okay. to ask one question because I also did one time this booth thing. Uh, it was you mean in StoryCorps? No, 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 nothing. Uh, it was, uh, we put a booth on a, um, uh, outside on the street uh, next to the cathedral in Cologne. It was World Youth Day and the Pope came to town and uh, the booth was called Talk to Him and so people could go in and leave a message for the Pope. And eventually, then we, table, we, we made it a CD and we, somebody gave it to the Pope later. So I don't know whether he actually ever listened to it, but uh, it did, didn't really matter for the project. And the project was a great success because obviously there were plenty of people in town and they used this opportunity to talk to the Pope. And, um, but we got a lot of intense stories, but we didn't get, I don't think the, the quality of the material was as good as, for example, the 9-11 stories. And so I want to ask you uh, about the actual radio broadcast because I think the trick you are using is, uh, is uh, that people are doing it in dialogues. They don't That's go right. in single and it's not like a confession, it's, uh, it's, it's a dialogue. And I think this is part of the trick and uh, also why it's so emotional. So I want to ask you, for example, this Father Michael Duffy story where you add material from the church. So. What do you change for the radio broadcast, which wasn't well, recorded a, that, in the booth? I, I th you're right. The, the, I mean, the difference of 
what, what this is, is uh, people make an appointment, nobody comes in off the street, people have thought about it before they come. I mean, it's the difference between being prepared for an interview or not. And you also have to know that, you know, our ratio of stories that are recorded to what's broadcast is, I don't know, 250 or 300 to one. So um, I was actually thinking um, earlier this week when someone was talking to me about this, it's almost like, I mean, if, if these are very intense interviews that are kind of distilling human wisdom, you know, you're kind of, it's almost like a test tube where you're spinning the test tube and you, and you, um, the, the, you, you spin it to get the, um, the one out of every 500 stories and then you spin it again to get the three minutes out of the 40 minutes. So it's very distilled and what we're, what we're looking for is, you know, what we're trying to do is something that's kind of akin to poetry, I think, every week. But that is, it is the dynamic of the two people who care about each other. And um, that goes back to what I was talking about, about the documentary I did many years ago with the kids interviewing each other. And that's the key to StoryCorps is that um, it's a conversation between two people. People can come alone and most 9-11 families come alone. Um, for, and, and that's a real outlier because most people come in pairs. If you come alone, there's always two facilitators at the booth. Um, one's usually outside with the next pair that's coming in and one's inside, but if you come alone, both facilitators will go in the booth and one will act as the um, interviewer and the other or the person you're in conversation with and the other will run the equipment. But that's the key, it's the conversation. And I'll do one more question and then... What do I what? Oh, so when, when in that, that p the homily piece was, I mean, that's a very atypical story core piece. I had actually um, known about, heard the homily, and I just thought it was gorgeous. Um, I'd read it. Um, so when uh, Duffy did the interview um, and talked about the, the, um, the uh, uh, giving that homily, we just added that audio. It's probably one out of 25 or 30 stories that we add an extra element to. And I, you know, I always used to think of when I made radio documentaries, it was like cooking, right? You have all these different ingredients and you want to figure out the best way to add the ingredients to make the best dish you possibly can. So in that case, there was this extra ingredient of the homily. But that's, um, that's pretty rare because, you know, in many cases, the voices you hear, there are no other recordings of them. And, and you know, part of the power of StoryCorps is that many, many cases, this is the only record of a person's life, period. Um, that it, that will exist after they pass away. I, I'll do one more question. Yeah. Uh, so um, I just played a video. Can I? No hostile questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, part of the beauty of Story Corps is, is the fact that it's a, a, a pain to get to your booth, and so um, these people will take it very seriously. They prepare for it. The tech right. quality is, is great. Um, it, it would be quite easy for for people to to record these stories themselves, and there's an enormous amount of talk. And pressure on organizations to make these things UGC so I wondered if there had been pressure on you to create an app where people can record these things on their phone send it in have a story court you know user generated content element yeah. and whether you would ever consider this well we you know I think the magic of when story core started I had a couple of theories about what needed to be present in order for a story core interview to work one was that you needed to be in the sacred space and that proved to be completely false we do interviews all over the place now something we developed three or four years into the project is the facilitators putting equipment on their back and like setting up in a quiet room anywhere and people have the exact same experience anywhere um, uh, as long as it's a quiet space and and uh, so so that was wrong uh, but my